Hello and welcome to Scripture Verse by Verse. My name is Michael Moret. Today we're in the Epistle of Jude. It's just one chapter. The chapter, the book of the Bible, that is right before the final book, the book of Revelation. So get your Bible, open it up to Jude, and we will begin in just one minute. The Scripture Verse by Verse website, found at thebibleversebyverse.com is a place that you should check out if you have not. If you have a love for God's Word, that's a pretty good place to go if I do say so myself because I've been teaching the Holy Bible here on Scripture verse by verse for over 33 years, and I've saved all my work. It's archived almost three, no, I should say almost four complete series going through the entire Bible, in-depth Bible study, verse by verse, all 66 books of the Bible, almost four complete at the Bible verse by verse dot com. Click and listen. That's all you have to do. Study at your pace, at your convenience. Again, that's at the Bible verse by verse dot com. Father, we pray that you would sanctify us by your truth. Your word is truth. In Jesus' name, amen. Jude verse 1. Jude, the servant of Jesus Christ and brother of James, to them that are sanctified by God the Father and preserved in Jesus Christ and called. Now, there's an awful lot in this first verse of Jude. And the first thing that I want you to notice is that it says that we are kept by Jesus Christ, and we are. We are kept by Jesus Christ if we are one of the called, if we are one of the elect. Jesus will never leave us nor forsake us. We can walk away from him if we lose our faith, if we turn away, if we allow sin to widow away at our faith, if we don't repent, if we don't confess and it starts to eat away at our faith, and we no longer believe in Christ and we no longer want him, well, he'll honor our free will, but he'll never leave us or forsake us and he will keep us for as long as we want to be kept. Jude, the servant of Jesus Christ and brother of James, to them that are sanctified by God the Father and preserved in Jesus Christ and called. If we are saved, truly saved, then we are preserved by Jesus Christ because those two things go hand in hand. In other words, being saved and being preserved go hand in hand. In other words, if we persevere with Jesus, if we continue in the faith, in our faith in Jesus Christ, then our faith in Jesus Christ will preserve us. Jesus will, by faith, by our faith, preserve us. And by his power, we have to continue to have faith in Jesus Christ and his finished work on the cross. And if we do do that, it's only by the grace of God. God's grace makes it possible for anyone to do that. We are kept by God's grace. We are preserved by God's grace. We are saved by God's grace. We cannot save ourselves we cannot keep ourselves saved either. And so it says, Jude, the servant of Jesus Christ and brother of James, to them that are sanctified by God the Father and preserved in Jesus Christ and called. The word called means to be elect. It means predestined. If you are predestined, if you are called to be saved, if you have responded correctly to that of your own free will, because we all have a free will, then God will preserve you. Stay with Jesus. He will never leave you or forsake you. You don't have to worry about that. You say, yeah, but Murat, I sin sometimes. So he's not going to kick you out of his family because you sin. Faith got, got you into his family and a, a lack of faith, the absence of faith, is the only thing that can get you out of his family. Verse 2. Mercy unto you and peace and love be multiplied. 
And I want to focus on that very first word in verse 2, the word mercy. God pities us and he forgives us in Jesus Christ. He pities us and he forgives us in Jesus Christ. And do you know what that is? That is his mercy. We need God's mercy today. And we will need it on Judgment Day as well. Because we're sinners. We need God's mercy and we need a lot of it. We need it multiplied. As Jude says right here. We need it multiplied. We need an abundance. And fortunately for us in Christ, we have more mercy than what we need. You don't have to worry about it. The Bible says this to Christians. Where sin abounds, grace does much more abound. Which means this. Sit down. Hang on. This is great news. You can't possibly out sin the grace of God. Do you hear that? You can't out sin the grace of God. So let's just speak hypothetically here for a second and say that you commit a lot of sins as a Christian. And you confess those sins. God never says, well, you stepped over the line, boy. So I'm not going to forgive you this time. He doesn't say that. Because his mercy is always greater than our sin. God is always one step ahead of us with his mercy. As long as we are Christians, as long as we're trusting in Jesus Christ to be our Lord and Savior, then we have God's mercy. And as when it comes to fellowship with God, as long as we, as Christians, confess and repent our sins, we're in good shape as far as that goes. Verse 3, Beloved, when I gave all diligence to write unto you the common salvation, it was needful for me to write unto you and exhort you that ye should earnestly contend for the faith which was once delivered unto the saints. So when Jude first sat down and decided to write this letter to these Christians, he had one thing in mind. He was going to talk about their common salvation. This was going to be a good time. Jude was going to talk about how great it is to be saved. How encouraging and how wonderful it is to be saved. He was all set to start writing. Jude originally wanted to talk about positive things. Like all the wonderful riches we have in Christ. But instead, he had to shift gears and warn these Christians about false teachers. And of course, what he ended up writing wasn't nearly as much fun as what he originally intended to say, but he knew that that's what the Holy Spirit wanted him to write. And even though it would not be his first choice, he determined to do it, and he did. It would be nice, speaking as a Bible teacher, it would be nice if a Bible teacher could just talk about positive things all the time. But in this world, that's impossible. Not if you're going to be faithful to Jesus. Because there are problems in this world. There are attacks against Christians and Christianity, and they must be dealt with, and it's not fun, and it's not positive. It would be nice if we could always just talk about happy, upbeat things, but when there is spiritual danger like there was with these Christians, it has to be exposed in order to protect God's people, and that's what Jude is going to write about, and that's what Jude is going to do because Jude is faithful to Almighty God. Verse 4, For there are certain men crept in unawares who were before of old ordained to this condemnation, ungodly men, turning the grace of our God into lasciviousness and denying the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. Notice, 
there were certain men who crept in unawares, sneaky, snakes, serpents. These false teachers snuck in. The dirty, low-crawling snakes, the dirty, filthy, spiritual cockroaches. They snuck in. They crept in unawares. They snuck in under the radar, posing as Christians. They were posing as Bible teachers, but in reality, they were tools of the devil. If you got to be sneaky and you're trying to convince Christians or the unsaved to join your group, to join your church, or to join your cult, and you got to be sneaky about it, Does, isn't that a wake-up call for you? Can't you see that's not how God does business? Can't you see that's the devil's M.O.? For again, for there were there are certain men crept in unawares who were before of old ordained to this condemnation, ungodly men, turning the grace of our God into lasciviousness and denying the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. So some false teachers were saying that sin is no big deal. They were saying, if you're a Christian, then sin is nothing to worry about. It's no big deal at all. That's what they were saying. Just like some today. Like many professing Christians and professing Bible teachers today, they were saying, you don't have anything to worry about. You don't have to worry about sin if you're a Christian because you're under God's grace and you have liberty in Christ. And of course, that is true. We are under God's grace, and we do have liberty in Christ. But what they were saying was only half the truth. Many today are saying the same sort of thing that the false teachers in Jude's day were saying. You don't have to worry about it. You don't, you don't have to be concerned about sin in your life. Don't worry about it. You're under God's grace. And of course, anyone who says that or even implies that has turned God's grace into a license to sin. And it was never intended to be that. In fact, Paul, the apostle in the book of Romans, condemns that kind of thinking. Actually, the Bible says that the grace of God teaches us to deny ungodliness. The grace of God doesn't make you think that you have a license to sin or that sin is no big deal. That's not God's grace. That's not what God's grace teaches Christians. If you're getting that kind of teaching, it's not coming from the Holy Spirit. The grace of Almighty God teaches Christians to deny ungodliness. In other words, God's grace teaches us to turn away from sin. And God's grace working in connection with the Holy Spirit in us gives us the power to turn away from sin and to live for Jesus and the desire to do that. And it's inside of every true born-again Christian. Every truly saved human being has a desire to please Christ because they've been saved by the grace of God. The grace of God is at work in them and the grace of God is teaching them to deny ungodliness. Do you see that? And yes, there is mercy. We've already seen that. There's definitely mercy through Jesus Christ. And we need all that mercy all the time. We need a lot of it too. But never turn God's grace into a license to sin. Never say, well, sin is no big deal. We're all under grace. That's what they were saying back then. And that's what many are saying today. And even if they don't say those exact words, they certainly imply it in many ways. They imply it when they continually and willfully ignore preaching against sin. By not preaching against sin and calling sin what it is and willfully ignoring their duty to call people to repentance, they are, by the lack of what they're saying, Suggesting that sin is no big deal. Don't worry about it. Anyone. 
I don't care if you call yourself a Christian or not, anyone who willfully lives in sin and doesn't repent and has the attitude that it's no big deal is going to end up in the lake of fire because they are not saved according to biblical criteria. And that's the only thing that matters. And thank God that he tells us ahead of time so that we can line things up before we die because then it will be too late. Verse 5, I will therefore put you in remembrance, though ye once knew this, that the Lord, having saved the people out of the land of Egypt afterwards, destroyed them that believe not. Now, stop right there for a second. God the Holy Spirit, notice, in the first part of verse 5, I will therefore put you in remembrance. God the Holy Spirit repeated or is about to repeat what he had said before because evidently the Christians had either forgotten or were on the verge of forgetting the biblical truth that was so important. Truth needs to be repeated because the world, the flesh, and the devil are relentless in pumping our minds full of filth and trash and unbiblical teaching and sinful thoughts and sinful attitudes and so on and so forth. The world, the flesh, and the devil are relentless. And for every time our soul is intruded by sinful thoughts and videos and pictures and words, we should match it with words from the Bible. And that means putting the same truth into our soul over and over and over again. That's okay. You say, Moret, I've heard all this before. Well, you're hearing it again. And it's biblical. Five again. I will therefore put you in remembrance, though ye once knew this. You've already heard this. You bought it. Seems like some of them were unbuying it. You once knew this, that the Lord, having saved the people out of the land of Egypt afterwards, destroyed them that believe not. So, Jude is going to use some examples from biblical history to back up what he's saying about the damnable heresy of turning God's grace into a license to sin and thinking that you're going to be fine. He's going to use some biblical examples, and it begins with the Israelites. As I alluded to in a few, a few minutes ago, people say, I accepted Christ, so I can sin as a way of life. It's no big deal. And don't say people don't have that attitude. I've been saved 40 years. I know what the score is. People say, I've accepted Christ. I can sin. As a way of life, it's no big deal. And let me tell you that that is precisely the attitude among many neo-evangelicals today. Or have you noticed that yourself? I can sin. It's no big deal because you know what? No, tell me what? I prayed the sinner's prayer. Well, congratulations. If you prayed the sinner's prayer, and you have an attitude of, I can sin, it's no big deal, then that prayer bounced off the ceiling and meant absolutely nothing. But that is the attitude of many neo-evangelicals today. And I get it that most probably don't say it. They, they don't come right out and say, it's no big deal. Some do. But even if they don't come right out and say it, you know as well as I do, if you've ever gone to those churches, or maybe you're in a church like that right now, you know as well as I do, even if they don't come right out and admit it, it's still there, and it's very prominent. Many believe that, <clears throat> excuse me, many believe that, and many think it. It's all grace. We don't have to think about sin. We don't have to worry about sin. Just forget it. Lighten up. We don't have to think about sin. It's no big deal. It's all grace. Oh, really? Hmm. 
then what in the world is the Holy Spirit saying through Jude to Christians right here? Tell you what he's saying. He's saying the exact opposite of what you're hearing in those kind of churches. God saved his people from Egypt. They turned and said, thank you very much, Lord, by sinning as a way of life. And they did not repent and they sinned and they sinned. And as a result, they were never made, able to make it into the promised land. They were judged by God. So don't believe those who say sin will not affect your standing with God now that you're a Christian. It has absolutely no effect on your standing with God now that you are a Christian. Don't believe those people because that's exactly what Jude is warning about here. That's exactly what he's warning about. It does affect your relationship with God. And then he gives a, a second example in verse 6. Look at verse 6. And the angels who kept not their first estate, but left their own habitation, he hath reserved in everlasting chains under darkness unto the judgment of the great day. The Israelites that God saved, but turned their back on God, the Israelites who did not obey and the angels who did not obey were judged by God as well. So who says sin does not matter? That's not what Jude is saying. And who in the world would dare change God's grace into a license to sin? When you look at what God's word says. These angels who didn't think that their sin was a big deal knew that they had made a fatal mistake in their thinking when God threw them into the bottomless pit so fast that it made their devil-loving minds spin. And there's a lot of sloppy theology today. Theology where teachers read into scriptures what they wanted to say and what the people wanted to say rather than letting the word of God speak for itself. And that was happening to the people who this book was originally written to. And it's happening an awful lot today. This book is very up to date. Now look at verse 7. Even as Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities about them, in like manner, giving themselves over to fornication, going after strange flesh, are set forth for an example, suffering the vengeance of eternal fire. Notice what the Bible says here. The people of Sodom, Sodom and Gomorrah are set forth as an example. So you have the Israelites who sinned. You have the angels who sinned. You have the people of Sodom and Gomorrah who sinned. So I guess... The preachers who tell people that Christ doesn't have to be your Lord, just ask him to be your Savior. You don't have to submit to his Lordship. You don't have to worry about obedience to him. You don't have to worry about holiness as long as you've asked him to be your Savior. You don't have to worry about making him the Lord of the life. I guess those people who say that sort of thing are going to have an awful lot of explaining to do on Judgment Day because if that's not turning God's grace into a license to sin, then words mean absolutely nothing. And of course, that's what they're doing. So look at seven again. Even as Sodom and Gomorrah and these cities about them in like manner, giving themselves over to fornication and going after strange flesh are set forth for an example, suffering the vengeance of eternal fire. Again, even as Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities about them in like manner, giving themselves over to fornication and going after strange flesh, are set forth as an example, suffering the vengeance of eternal fire. Some people think that hell is not eternal fire. God says it is. Jesus says it is. It's eternal fire. It's a fire that burns and burns and burns, but it doesn't consume. Like the burning bush in Moses' day. 
You need further proof? The Bible says the smoke of their torment goes up forever and ever. And what is perfectly clear from this verse is that God judges wicked behavior. In fact, what is clear from the previous several verses where Jude uses these examples of people, some who claim to be God's people, sinning and sinning and being punished, is that God judges wicked behavior and clearly his people are not excluded from that judgment. Living sinfully with no confession and no repentance is not the lifestyle of someone who is on their way to heaven. Now you could say, well, they must have been saved and they lost their salvation. Or you can say, well, they were never saved to begin with because they didn't perse persevere. You know what? I don't care what you say. It doesn't matter. Say whatever you want to say. That's an argument for another program. Or you can say they were never saved to begin with or they were saved and are not saved now. You can say whatever you want to say. The important thing to see is that they're not saved now. And how do you know? because they're sinning and sinning, and it's no big deal to them. The people Jude was writing to were, were turning God's grace into a license to sin and were not saved now. And people who live as if sin is no big deal today and think they're fine because they prayed the sinner's prayer or they've been confirmed or they've been baptized as a baby or as an adult are out of their minds. You're not saved. The Bible says, to those of us who believe, to those of us who are saved, Christ is precious. And you don't thumb your nose up at someone who is precious to you. And you don't live in, a, in an abominable manner toward those people. So don't say that you're saved. You are kidding yourself. And you better unkid yourself before you die. You're going to end up in the lake of fire along with the devil and his angels. Let's look at verse 8. In like manner also these filthy dreamers defile the flesh, despise dominion, and speak evil of dignities. In like manner also these filthy dreamers. It is amazing. It is amazing how self-deceived, false teachers, and godly people in general can actually be. Self-deceived. I mean self-deceived. Even with all the examples of wicked people and wicked angels who have been judged by God, some are still convinced that their sin is no big deal. I don't understand it. I don't get it. How you can just shut your eyes to what the Word of God clearly says over and over again is just beyond me. But many do even though angels and people have been judged by God because of their wickedness, they're still convinced that their sin is no big deal. That for some strange, perverted, unbiblical reason, they're the exception to the rule and God will not deal with them as he has consistently dealt with others in the past who willfully, with malice and aforethought, continued in a lifestyle of sin. Somehow they have convinced themselves with absolutely no support in the realm of reality, that they will be the exception. And they're somehow going to get away with their sin. Their unbridled sin. The sin that they don't repent of. The sin that they don't feel the need to confess. Because after all, they're just carnal Christians. Oh, sure, you're saved. You're just a carnal Christian. Don't worry about it. You better worry about it because that person telling you that is a liar. There is no biblical reason to believe what those people are believing and to teach what those teachers are teaching. You can make Jesus your Savior without making him your, your Lord. That is saying, my friends, that is saying, when you hear somebody say that, you can make Jesus your Savior and he can be your Savior and you won't go to hell without making him your Lord. That is saying that God's grace is giving you a license to sin. And I know it's very popular today. I understand that. But remember, Jesus said, narrow is the way that leads to life, and few there be that find it. And broad is the road that leads to destruction, and many 
go there on, and I'm out of time. Study with me at the thebibleversebyverse.com. If you get a chance, you want to be a part of this ministry, click the donate button at the top of the front page and prayerfully give as the Lord may lead. We'll pick it up here in verse 8 with some unfinished business next time.